All right, well, as we come to the Advent season, we're going to be spending this time in Luke's gospel. So I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. I do need to just go ahead and do a side note real quick. I need to ask you for some grace this morning. I need to ask you for some mercy. I'm either coming into or coming out of a head cold. Let me stop. I have two negative COVID tests, so otherwise I would not be here, but my throat feels like it's on fire, and I'm giving it everything I got this morning, so I need some grace, need some mercy, and appreciate that in advance. Um, But friends, with that said, let's look at Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. As we enter into this season, it should be joyous, right? It should be exciting. We get to turn from our October, Halloween, November, like Thanksgiving, bah humbugs about putting Christmas lights out too early, about putting Christmas decorations up too early. Like how many of you, just quick show of hands, it feels weird if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot on November the 1st, the day after Halloween and all the Christmas stuff is already up. Like that feels weird to me and I'm only 42. Some of y'all think I'm like old-fashioned or like an old soul, and maybe I am, but it just feels odd. But here's the thing. I love Christmas. Now that it's here, we get to celebrate it. But as we celebrate it, how do we celebrate it without really making sure we know, we understand the Christmas season, what it means, what it's about? There's a lot that our Lord puts into the arrival of Jesus, right? Like in Luke's gospel, what I love about looking at in Luke's gospel It's not just that we get to look at the birth of Jesus. It's like the birth of Jesus, right, is chapter two. You've got an entire chapter that precedes it. The coming of Jesus is so magnificent. magnificent. It's so great. It's so earth-shattering. We don't just need to know about the coming of Jesus. We need to know about the work the Lord did in sending an angel to Mary to prepare her for Jesus. But that's not all. We also needed to learn about John the Baptist, right? Like Jesus' coming is so amazing. God prepares us to receive Jesus, and in our text this morning, he prepares us to receive John, right? Like John's just Jesus' herald. He just points the way, right? How do you understand John the Baptist? Here's how you understand John the Baptist. How many of you understand or are familiar with the fact that we have ambassadors to other countries, right? Pretty simple concept, no? All right, we got some civics we got to learn here. All right, here's what you need to know about an ambassador, An ambassador represents the president to other countries. When I was in the army, if an ambassador came, you treated that ambassador like you did the president. That ambassador was saluted by four-star generals. That ambassador spoke on behalf of the president. That ambassador was a herald, one who spoke for the president. Do you see that? That's what John the Baptist is. And Luke devotes something like 60 verses to the coming of John. We need to understand John. When we understand John, we start to understand something of the the awe and the wonder that is coming when Christ finally comes. So let's dig into this text. Let's learn from this text. I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to break down the three things we learn, not from John's birth, but just from the announcement of John's birth. All right, watch this. Luke chapter 1, picking it up in verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, 
even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Friends, this is God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. It is given to us in love and for our good. All right, we've got John coming. We've got an ambassador on the way. What do we learn? What do we learn? Here's the three things that we're going to see and learn this morning. Here's three things we're going to unpack. First, we see when John the Baptist comes, this shows that God will, number one, bring his hope to the downtrodden. He will bring his hope to the downtrodden. Number two, he will bring his holiness to our hearts. He will bring his holiness to our hearts. And number three, he will bring healing to our stains. He will bring his healing to our stains. There is hope, there is holiness, there is healing on the way. Let's go ahead, let's jump in. Let's look at that first one. When John the Baptist comes, we see that God is bringing his hope to the downtrodden, bringing his hope to the downtrodden. Did you know that as you read Luke's gospel, A big theme that Luke is consciously presenting to you is that our God has a soft spot in his heart for the less fortunate. He has a heart for the downtrodden. Jesus is always talking to some kind of outcast, whether it's a tax collector who you did not talk to, you rejected, you stayed away from, they were dirty, icky people. Whether it was the lame or the mute who people believe were cursed or stricken by God, and so you dissociated from them. Jesus is always eating, fellowshipping with, talking to, healing someone who is outcast. Why? Because our God has a heart for the downtrodden. If Jesus were here today, like if he were to come back right now, or if we were living in Jesus' times, what would it look like? Jesus would spend a lot of time in the trailer parks or the inner city projects. He would bring hope into those areas that know downtroddenness. Let's see this in the text. Let's go to verse 5. Verse 5, what do we see there in verse 5? and verse 6, what do we see? We see Zechariah. We see Elizabeth. We see a priestly family. They're like a pastor and a pastor's wife. At first, they don't look downtrodden. They look like they're doing okay. They look like they, they have social prestige, right? But actually... Look at verse 7. Zechariah and Elizabeth join the ranks of the downtrodden. Why? They cannot have kids. They cannot have kids. We're going to unpack this more in our third and final point, but suffice to say for right now, the fact that they don't have kids means that they feel like or can even be treated like, even among the priests, as an outcast. They're downtrodden. But there's more downtroddenness in this first part of our passage. There's a downtroddenness we need to unpack. We need to explain a little bit. As we go to verses 8 through 11, we're going to see that the whole nation of Israel is joining the ranks of the downtrodden. How can I say that? How can I say that? Here's how I can say that. Look with me at verses 8 through 10. Do you see how Zechariah is chosen, is chosen to offer incense? 
This is a very big honor. This is a very big deal. You only got to do it once in your life. So Zachariah is getting a little bit of a sense of hope, a little bit of a sense of reprieve of being honored. Why is this a big deal, though? Why does this matter? That incense symbolizes and represents the prayers of the nation. It represents, as that smoke goes up, it represents the people that are outside in a period of prayer, praying for the nation of Israel. Look at verse 10. It should explain this. Do you see how in verse 10, the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Zechariah goes into the temple to offer before the Lord the prayers of the people, and here's the thing. This is significant. This is important. Why is this important? Because later tradition tells us the exact words of the prayer that they prayed. Here's what Zechariah would have prayed. Here's what the people would have been praying for. They would have prayed this. May the merciful God enter the holy place and accept with favor the offering of his people. They ask for God to be merciful. They ask for God to enter and to meet with them. They ask for favor, which is the Old Testament word for grace. They're asking for grace. As they pray for him to accept the offering, they're saying, please let us know that our sins are atoned for. This is a prayer for redemption. This is a prayer for redemption. That's what Zechariah is praying. That's what the people are praying. I think there's a lot of confusion, especially when we get to verse 13. Zechariah is praying for the nation's redemption. The people are praying for the nation's redemption. Why? Israel is downtrodden. How is Israel downtrodden? Why do they need to pray this prayer that they're praying right now? Here's why. Here's why. They want to be redeemed. They want to be redeemed. They want to be redeemed from bad government. The man ruling over them is a man called Herod the Great. He was a cruel narcissist who murdered his family to get to the top and to stay at the top. For those of you who are familiar with Matthew chapter 2, right after Jesus is born, what happens to all the little babies, all the little baby boys in his hometown? Anybody? They're murdered. Who wipes them out? Herod's the man who gives the order. This is a cruel man. They are under a harsh ruler. They want redemption from bad government. But that's not all. What else do they want redemption from? They want redemption from God's silence. They want to be redeemed from a state of silence between them and their God. How can I say that? Well, we've just ended the Old Testament, moved into the New Testament when you get to Luke 1, right? But there's 400 years from the closing of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament. For 400 years, there has not been a prophet in Israel. There has not been a prophet bringing God's word, reminding them of God's promises, encouraging them along the way, bringing comfort along the way, reminding them that God is still good to his promises. It's been a time of silence. They want to be redeemed from bad government. They want to be redeemed from silence. They want to hear from their God. They also want to be redeemed from sin, right? Like like they want to know that God accepts this offering, They long to know that they are in right relationship with God, especially since they are in the days where there is no king. Their ancestors went into exile and the monarchy ended. They are ruled by a foreign government. They want to know that they are in right relationship with the true king, the Lord God Almighty. They want redemption. Do you kind of feel for these people? I hope you can see that. There's so many clear connections to today. Whether you're on the left or you're on the right, don't you want to be ruled by good government? (laughs) Right? Like, when was the last time Congress had an approval rating above 40%? 2005. Who was the last president who averaged more than a 50% approval rating? You have to go back to the 20th century with Bill Clinton, right? Who doesn't want to hear from God? Who does not want to know that they are close to God? Who does not want to live their life with a sense of God's presence in their life? We all do. And look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. What does the angel say when he shows up to Zechariah? Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. There is redemption coming for the nation. 
There is redemption coming for the nation. But what else? What else does the angel say? The angel says, oh, by the way, Zechariah, you and Elizabeth get to participate in that redemption that is coming to Israel. Why? Why? Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. For your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Zechariah, you will have a son who will prepare the way for the coming Redeemer. You will have a son who will play the lead role in making sure the path for the coming Redeemer is made straight. There is national redemption that is coming. There is personal redemption that is coming. Do you see our God's heart for the downtrodden? Do you see him providing hope for the downtrodden? When Zechariah entered to pray that prayer, would he have been thinking of this? Would he have thought to have prayed this prayer, or would he have expected to get a prayer answered in this way? This is remarkable. This is amazing, right? He gets to have a personal stake, a personal involvement in this. This is our God's heart for the downtrodden. Are you here today? And do you know a sense of downtroddenness? Are you down in the dumps? Is the weight of life getting to you? Across our country, we need hope. We need hope. I could cite divorce statistics, mental health statistics. I would even love to talk about how, on average, a a veteran commits suicide every 65 minutes. 22 veterans commit suicide every day. I, I would love to break out some more statistics for you, but I want to turn in particular to the holidays and prove to you that in our society, we need hope. Did you know that during the holidays, 65% of people who have a mental health problem report that their mental illness gets worse during the holidays? Did you know that you can go on WebMD and actually look up a condition called holiday blues? That's crazy, right? It's supposed to be a time of cheer. Did you know that the divorce lawyers are getting uh, ready, they are gearing up for January, February, and March. Why? January is referred to as divorce month in their circles. Why? Because a lot of people fake it through the holidays. Think about how awkward that is. Think about the awkwardness for the children, right? Do we need hope? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, we need hope. We need hope. And does our God provide hope? He absolutely does. He does. So what do you do if you are here today? What do you do if you're here today and there's a medical hardship, a financial hardship, relational hardship? What do you do if you're here today and you just had yet another fight around the family dinner table? What if you're here today and you go, I'm all alone. I wish I had family to fight with. What do you do? You turn to the Lord who provides hope for the downtrodden. How do you do that? How do you turn to him? Well, as you pick up the pages of the Bible, as you read the pages of the Bible, you will read the very heart of God. You will see time and again that he really does look out for those who are marginalized. He really does look out for the outcast. He really does look out for the person who's down in the dumps. As you pick up the Bible, you will find hope, but that's not all. As you go to him in prayer, we just had a two-week mini-sermon series on prayer. As you go to him in prayer, what are you doing? You're talking with him, but what are you doing? As you pour your heart, as you pour your pain, as you pour your sorrow out, what are you doing? You're not just reading the pages of God's heart. When you pray, you're letting him read the pages of your heart. And as there is an intersection and a connection between you reading God's heart and God's reading yours in the word and in prayer, what happens? You learn that he cares. You learn that he is sympathetic. You learn that he is a father who has lost a son and he knows what it's like. You can relate to him. You can connect to him. Turn to him and know comfort today. If you're here and things are going just fine, I'm not downtrodden. Praise God, right? Yes, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. But what do you do if you're here 
hearing that God provides hope for the downtrodden, but you're not experiencing downtrodden. As Pastor John, I don't really connect with this. What do I do? Here's what you do. Go be God's hands and put God's heart on display by bringing hope to the downtrodden this Advent season. Go find a toy drive. Go find a food drive. Go, go find some way you can serve or help the poor. Please, bring your children along. Teach them to serve. Build in them a rhythm of service. Let them be shaped and, and then go back and show them in God's word. This is why we did this. It's not just to be nice, good, Midwest or Southern Bible people. No, this is our God's heart. This is who he is. This is what he's done for us in Jesus. How, my son, how, my daughter, can we not go out and want to serve the downtrodden the way he has done for us and for others? There is hope for the downtrodden. Does that sound good, Grace? Amen. Amen. There is hope for the downtrodden, but there is more than that. We see that when John the Baptist comes, God brings holiness to our hearts. He brings holiness to our hearts. As God prepares salvation, let's, let's look at verses 11 through 17, and let's see how God is bringing holiness, and then let's apply that. Let's apply that to our lives as we look at that and in verses 18 through 22. Look with me at verse 11. An angel appears. Zechariah goes into the temple. An angel appears. Zechariah is afraid, right? Like this angel is impressive. Zechariah is like, is this good news? Is this bad news? A lot of horror movies begin this way. What's going on? The man is scared, right? But in verse 12, excuse me, not in verse 12, in verse 13, in verse 13, we hear beautiful words. Fear not. Fear not, Zechariah. This is going to be good news. Look at verse 14. There's joy. There's rejoicing. There's gladness. There's happiness coming your way. Why? Because you're going to have a son. And look at what this son is going to do. Look at verse 15. He's going to be great before the Lord. He, he's going to be used by the Lord. He might be the first human to be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. He is to be set apart. He is to be used. He is not to be filled with alcohol. He is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No, that doesn't mean you can't drink alcohol during the Advent season. The Rogers will be doing it in moderation. But here's the thing. This is a mark of his being set apart. He is to be used. And in verses 16 to 17, how is he going to be used? Zechariah. He's going to be used in a powerful way. Look at these words in verses 16 and 17. Turn many, not the people of Israel, but who? The children of Israel. Now there's family language. The Lord, their God, not the Lord God, not the Lord the God, their own personal God. He will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah. He'll turn hearts. There's more family language, father and children. The disobedient will turn to wisdom. What is he going to do? This sounds like revival, right? This sounds like an outbreak of what we would call holiness. And yes, that is absolutely the case. That is absolutely what is going to happen. How can I say that? How can I prove that to you? Look with me at verse 17. Look with me at verse 17. There's something beautiful happening in verse 17. As we look at verse 17, we need to compare it with the very final words of the Old Testament. Let's go next slide. You see the angel is quoting the very end of the Old Testament. The last words in the Old Testament are found in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. What does it say there in Malachi 4, 5 and 6? Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Do you see how the angel's quoting that in verse 17? Well, what's the context of Malachi? Why is he quoting Malachi? First, this is an amazing, beautiful thing. Why? Because God has been silent for 400 years. These are the last words that he spoke. And now as he's sending a prophet, John, one who will prepare the way for Jesus, he picks right back up where he started and he says, this is going to happen now. This is here. It has arrived. The day has come. And if Malachi, when you read it, was talking about a revival. If all of this turn language sounds like revival, John is coming to bring revival. He is coming to bring holiness to the hearts of Israel. 
This is a beautiful thing. Did Israel need more holiness? Well, yeah. Yeah. Can I just condense verses 18 through 22? Like, what is Zechariah, a priest? <laughs> Does he need more holiness in his life? Yeah. How can we say that? Does he believe the angel? No. He doesn't believe the angel. The angel says, because you don't believe me, zzz, puts him on mute for nine months, right? Like, it, it, like, like, this would be like me, like, seeing an angel, I'm the pastor, and being like, oh, really, this is going to happen. Okay, how am I going to know? Right? And then coming back to y'all to stand up and preach and go, right? Like, this isn't good when the priests are, are, are experiencing a crisis of faith. Israel needed to grow in holiness. Go home. Read Luke chapter 3. You will see the, the crowds lined up to hear John's preaching, to be baptized. This is going to be a beautiful thing. But here's the thing we've got to ask. What about you and me? What do we learn about holiness? What do we learn about holiness? Why do we need to talk about holiness? I think there's a lot of questions that come up. I think holiness is like legalism. It's one of those words we throw around in the church. And we kind of get it, but we kind of don't. So can we stop and can we talk about holiness for a minute? First, let's ask, why do we need holiness? Why do we need to talk about it? Well, here's the thing. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 says this, be perfect, you must be perfect, as my Father in heaven is perfect. We must be perfect in holiness. We must be perfect in righteousness. If our God is holy, if He is perfect, if we are not, how can we be admitted into His presence? We need holiness. We need righteousness. We need perfection to, to join Him, right? To be with Him for all eternity. We need holiness. Now that we know why we need it, what is it? What is it? And this is where I think some of the confusion sets in. You see, I want to actually put forward two types of holiness this morning. We see these two types in our text, right? There is the type of holiness that we will call useful holiness or, or missionary or missional holiness. That's one, missional holiness. Is John set apart to be used by God to accomplish his purposes in this world? Is John being set apart to be used in this world of God to accomplish his purposes. Yeah, yeah, there is an aspect of holiness. The word holiness means set apart. There's an aspect of holiness that means we are set apart to be used by God. We are to accomplish, we are to advance his mission, his plan, his purpose for planet Earth. That's one kind of holiness. But there's another kind of holiness. We'll call this moral holiness. Look with me at verse 17. As holiness goes forward, what is John going to do? He's going to turn the disobedient, right? Obedience, disobedience. That has a moral overtone, right? He's going to turn the disobedient to wisdom. So there is the missional holiness of being used and set apart by God to be used for him to advance his purposes in this world. But then there is the moral holiness where we are set apart to live in such a way that reflects God's character. Are we clear on this? Missional, moral, does this make sense? Quick show of hands. We get this. This is important. Why? Because I think there's two holes in our holiness. This sets up a tension. All right, let's, let's use caricatures. I'm not saying this is every church out there, but in the churches I've been in and the churches I've seen as I talk to people, what do traditional churches tend to hone in on when it comes to holiness? Would you say they err on the side of moral holiness or do they err on the side of missional holiness? Moral, yeah, they tend to err on the side of overemphasizing moral holiness. Let's call this defense, right? We play defense in traditional churches. Does Grace Church have some traditional bones in its body? Yes, we do, and we are proud of that. Why? The law matters. God's commands matter. We want people to follow God's laws. We want moral holiness. But if you overemphasize it, what can happen? Can you lose outreach? Yeah. 
Can you get caught up in following the rules and emphasizing that over relationship with God as a father? Can you follow the rules to win God's approval and start following the rules to get other people's approval rather than living a moral, holy life to say thank you for what God has already done for you? Yes, you can slide into that. I did not say every church does that, but that certainly can happen, right? We can err on the side of moral holiness and look at the results. What happens when we err on the side of just missional holiness, right? I've been in contemporary churches. I've been in the seeker-sensitive world. What happens when we err on the side and overemphasize, get them in, right? Let's go out and let's bring people in. Is that a good desire? It's a wonderful desire. It's an amazing thing. But what happens when we only play offense and we don't play defense? Can we become wishy-washy? Can we be scared to take a stand? Or when we take a stand, can we take a stand and it's more rooted and anchored in, well, how many people will agree with me rather than taking a stand that is rooted and anchored in God's character, right? We need both. They go together. And let me be clear, we don't need 50% of one. We don't need 50% of the other. We need 100% of missional holiness. We need 100% of moral holiness. That's what we're doing here at Grace Church. We, we want to have both of those working in harmony in unison, promoting each other. Does that make sense? Are we good? So let me ask, where would there be an imbalance in your life? Which one would you need to grow in to be holy, right? Like Jesus' standard is an all or none. We need to be perfect. We need to chase after that. What kind of holiness would you err on the side of? Which one would you need to grow in? Could I encourage you to just go this week to pray on that, to reflect on that, and maybe during the Advent season to say, okay, how can I work on this other aspect of holiness? How can I make sure I'm not emphasizing or pitting one against the other? In fact, I forgot to show you. Let me prove this to you one final time that this is a very good way of under... I recognize for some of you that this is new. This might be a little revolutionary, so let, me show, so let me show you another place you can find this in Scripture. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. First, when Peter addresses his crowd, do you see how he says, you are a holy nation? Okay, we're talking about holiness, right? Royal priesthood, that's holiness. Chosen race, that's holiness. That's set-apartness. All right, now go next slide. Let's look at this. What is the purpose of being set apart as a holy nation? It is to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus. There's the missional holiness. Now let's go next slide. At the same time, while talking about how to be a holy nation, do you see how Peter talks about how we are to abstain from the passions of the flesh? Do you see the moral holiness? Do you see the missional holiness? Do you see the moral holiness? They go together. All right, friends, we need to strive for that. All right, so we've got hope. We've got holiness. What's the final thing we need to see in our text? We need to see healing. We need to see healing. Why? Because John the Baptist's arrival shows us that there is healing for our stains. There is healing for our stains. Let's look at Elizabeth in our final three verses. Verse 23, John the Baptist goes home. Verse 24, there's a child. We're going to hone in on verse 25. Look at Elizabeth's words there. Look at her words. What does she say? The presence of John the Baptist removes her reproach from among the people. Oh, friends, this is wonderful news. This is good. Her reproach has gone. Let's unpack that a little bit more. Let's unpack that a little bit more. We talked earlier in our first point about how Zechariah and Elizabeth were barren. They were downtrodden. We didn't plumb the full depths of that, so let's do that now. First, barrenness or infertility can be a source of shame today, can't it? I've counseled more than one couple who can't have a child. It's sad. Sometimes it's for a season, sometimes it's permanent. Sometimes after the third or fourth miscarriage, you start to wonder, even if we're not infertile, are we ever going to have a child? I want to be very careful, very kind, very loving in how I talk about this, right? 
We feel shame. Why? We feel awkwardness. We feel loss. All of us have a deep desire to raise children, right? There's the comfort of having healthy children as we get older who will take care of us in our old age, right? Like in many ways, our children are our true IRA, right? We can put all the money aside, but I need kids to execute to go get the money to take care of me, right? There's also comfort and excitement and contentment that comes from knowing that your line, your legacy, your name will continue, right? Like when I go to Rogers Family Reunions in North Carolina, I am very well aware of the fact that I am one of the few men with the last name Rogers that is there. I think you have to go back to my great, great, great grandpa and then go down and outward to like my fourth or fifth cousins to find a male with the last name Rogers. I'm very well aware of the fact that one or two of my boys may or may not have kids, right, to continue that name. That name Rogers does not define me. It is not like my final sense of okayness, but it's important. And I think we all feel that. We all feel a desire for a legacy to leave behind, right? That's just what we feel today. Let's look at all that Elizabeth was feeling. I want to be very kind how I say this because she was facing some pressures that we don't face today. You see, in Elizabeth's day, when she was barren, when she was infertile, here's what she couldn't do. She couldn't, she couldn't fulfill the communal pressure to provide children so that your village could flourish. Children were workers. This is an agrarian society. You needed children for your village, for your community to be strong, to work the fields, to help repair things, to help build things. There was a communal pressure to provide males, especially for local patrols and to fill the ranks of Israel's army, right? Like everybody was drafted and you wanted to feel like you were contributing. But more than that, there was this communal misinterpretation of parts of Deuteronomy where if you did not have a child, people thought you were cursed by God, you were being punished by God, that there was some secret hidden sin in your life. So what was this like for Elizabeth? She knew the sideways glances that other ladies sent her. She knew what the talk was behind her back. She had to walk around wanting the whole world to see that she really was trying her best to be a good Israelite woman and that her heart really did beat for God. But no matter what she does, people would just be like, prove it, where's a kid? Then why don't you have a kid? Like nobody says that, but that's the unspoken thing that's going on, right? Elizabeth had to walk around carrying the weight of shame. Here's the thing. With John the Baptist's arrival, there is hope. There is hope. Her stain has been removed. Her shame has been removed. Oh, friends, are you here and are you carrying the weight of reproach or shame? Has something awful happened to you? Not just infertility, but anything. Have you done something awful to another person? Was it a poor financial decision? Was it mismanagement of the resources that you have? Was it an affair? Was it an addiction? Was it a bad decision at work that has left you tainted? In what ways are you damaged goods before another person's eyes? In what ways do you feel like damaged goods before God's own eyes? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Regardless of the burden you carry, the Lord God can remove that. He did it for Elizabeth. He will do it for you. Our God brought hope, holiness, and healing through the arrival of John the Baptist. He did it for them, and he can do it for you today. Only here's the thing. You get something better. You get something better than Elizabeth getting to hold little John. Why? You see, John the Baptist was just the beginning. He was the pointer to the better one who was to come after him. Whereas Zechariah, Elizabeth, and Israel got the promise of hope of holiness, of healing offered in John's arrival, you and I get the better, surer hope that comes with Jesus' arrival. 
You see, John is there to point us to Jesus, and Jesus is the one who died as the ultimate downtrodden one who rose from the dead. His resurrection provides the ultimate hope that we need in this world. But Jesus is also the one who came to live in our place, perfectly obeying God's moral laws, living a life of perfect moral holiness, but he also perfectly submitted himself to the Father to accomplish God's mission for humanity. Jesus is perfect in moral holiness. He is perfect in missional holiness. And now when we have faith in him, that perfect life is given to us, and we have all the holiness that we need, and it is written on our hearts. But Jesus is also the one who goes to the cross, where he takes all of our shame, and he places it on his shoulders. His sacrificial atoning death heals you and means you can stand without shame before God's throne. And if God does not hold those things against you, who else on earth can hold those things against you? No, there is hope, there is holiness, and there is healing at the Savior. Please come to Him, turn to Him, and know the fullness of salvation that John the Baptist can only point to. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we come before you. Father, we discuss heavy things, we discuss weighty things. Why? Because you are a real God who speaks into the heaviness, the mess of life. You are cleaning us up, Father. You are presenting us to yourself as your children, as your spotless children. And Father, you do it by bringing hope, by bringing holiness, and by bringing healing. Father, may we look to Jesus. Father, may we grow in those things. For those who need hope, please give them hope. For those who search for holiness, please show them that they need to pursue holiness. For those who need healing and they feel like damaged goods, please show them, Father, please show them that they are found in Christ and you look at them and smile. You see no shame. Oh, Father God, let this be true of us and please use us to take this wonderful news out to the world that needs it. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.